Hey, everybody. I'm Kim Holderness. And I'm Penn Holderness. Thank you for joining us on the Holderness Family Podcast. Um, if we decide to put this on YouTube, thank you for watching on our YouTube channel. We are actually, we're recording it because it's possible that this could be good stuff for YouTube. But if it's not, just forget we said this part. And thanks for listening. Thanks for just listening to us. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> Today's a, a big day. day. Yeah, okay. Can I just day. tell you something? Uh, our podcast is our very favorite thing that we do. We've talked about this a million times, it allows us to just learn more about each other, about marriage, about parenting, and about each other's interests. <laughs> and let me tell you, we've, um, on this podcast, a lot of times it's just conversations with the two of us. Um, sometimes we interview people, and we've interviewed some, like, fancy people, mm -hmm. okay? We've interviewed some, I mean, I feel pretty lucky that we've interviewed some fancy people. Got to find my light here, Penn. Um <sighs> And Penn is 1,000% of the, 100 percent of the time we've done the interviews. It, it, if say it starts at 2:30, he'll be coming upstairs to our little attic space here and hitting, just coming, getting a car. It's like 2:29 and I'm 30 like, seconds. Baby, yeah. come on! These people are very important. They have tight schedules. He's like, this man wanted me upstairs 15 minutes early. <laughs> he is so. I have never seen him so excited about somebody about anything and and our lives together. And it's been, it's been a journey. Thank you. Do you want to give us a little preview? Sure, I and, mean, okay. Yeah. All right. It's the guy who built the James Webb telescope or one of the many people he, well, led he was, the team. He was the commissioning manager. So he was, he, he's been with the project since 2005, maybe even before that was when they started doing the initial mock-ups. Do you guys know about me that I'm a space nerd? Should yes, we, we have a whole that? section. There's okay. a whole, there's a, you have a song about I, making me care about space. I do, I do. Should I, we play that? Uh, oh, this one's actually about Mars, right? Oh. Is, that, is that the one you're talking about? Nope, that's not it. There we go. Nope, that's not it. Kim's. Kim. Nope. Here we go. When are we going to Mars? Yeah. When are we going to Mars? We were supposed to go in like 2020, and that was two years ago. Wondering when we'll finally get to Mars. And then I talk about space. Yes, right? and then so, he, and then he, it's about like getting me to care about space things, and I care about space things. But there's just a lot of things on this planet, y'all, that I'm like really struggling with. So all this stuff out there mm -hmm. can't. It's just a lot. I understand that, and I right. actually I respect that thought and that stance. The thing is, I also think that people don't care about it because they haven't been properly educated about it. It's, I mean, it, it a lot of this stuff goes whoosh, like right over the heads of people. And often it's because those responsible for explaining it to us as a population are too smart for their own good. And I mean, that is the nicest compliment possible, right? right. And, and so I feel like it's my responsibility as a dumber person who has like learned, smart, but like not as smart yeah, as, them. as a stupider person who has, however, like read a ton of books on orbital physics and understands a little bit better about black holes and the in the theory of relativity, which was like put on dazzling display this last week by the web telescope. And also just like the search for intelligent life, which I've been fascinated with for years. Um, I, I want to be part of the group that brings it to people who either, don't quite understand it or haven't found something to really grasp onto. And I'm saying that with the understanding that there are plenty of problems going on in our planet. However, this week with the, the, the release of the James Webb telescopes, initial images to me, this is our moon landing. Um, we, we, Many of us were not a lot. Oh my gosh, he's here. Oh my gosh. Oh my okay. gosh. He's Keith Parrish is. Oh he, he, just, he, okay. he wants to be admitted to the Zoom. Okay, okay you guys. Okay, sorry. Okay. I got to stop what I'm doing because this guy is basically like George Clooney to me. Um, His name is Keith Parrish. We're going to say hi to him. Kim's going to give a little bio as no, well. No, you, you have to read the bio too. Okay, we'll just read it while he's in here because I, I can't okay. keep him waiting. I'm sure he's very important. Okay, this is exciting. Hey. <gasps> Hello, hey. Hi, Keith. Keith. <laughs> How are you? Hey, guys. Well, we're very excited to have you here. Um, right before you joined, we saw your name come up, and Penn's like, this is my George Clooney. So <laughs> he's very, we're both well, That's pretty funny. <laughs> that's funny. And very <laughs> handsome, very handsome. We get a lot of interview requests, and there's usually a newspaper or a magazine, you know, something little. But when I saw this one came in, I said, can I have that one? Yay! <laughs> so, well, so, we're yay. very excited. We're very excited. <laughs> right. We have to let the people know your very um, established 
resume and kind of the credentials you come with. You want to read this? It's a little fancier than ours. Yeah, we'll, we'll go back and forth. Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Keith Parrish was, as I said earlier, the commissioning manager for the James Webb Space Telescope at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. In this capacity, he led the planning and execution of on-orbit commissioning activities with specific emphasis on contingencies, countdown, and launch. We're going to talk about those. We're going to talk about what are called single failure tests. Uh, Mid-course corrections, deployments, and cool down to cryogenic temperature, because guess what? It's got to be in like absolute zero temperatures in order to, in order to work. Am I giving too much of my yes. commentary on this? Yes. Okay, why don't you read it? Because I'm getting like okay. too personal on this. Parrish has also served as web observatory manager since 2011, where he is responsible for ensuring observatory design and technical work that was aligned with the project's science and engineering priorities and budget and schedule resources. Wow, that's a lot. Uh, Parrish joined NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center 1990 and has been involved with design and launch of several science missions, including the launch of and first two servicing missions to the Hubble Space Telescope. He is a recipient of NASA's Outstanding Leadership Medal and Robert H. Goddard Honors uh, awards for Exceptional Achievement in Engineering and Management. Paris has a BS in Aerospace Engineering from University of Maryland College Park, a MS in Mechanical Engineering from George Washington University, a lifelong Maryland native. Parrish resides in Skiesville, Maryland with his wife, Deanna. They have three children, one a college junior, and two recent college graduates. Um that was that was a lot because you've accomplished a lot yes, sometimes. <laughs> no, sometimes we pare these down, but I felt like every line was necessary. No, that was all impressive. And there are some pictures that we want to that will eventually include one at like the start of what I think was this journey in your three small children, and then at the end with your grown children, and which is like how long right. this process is. Can I That's will great. I will say from the very beginning. Um, this podcast and this platform, probably not um, your your science journals that are interviewing you. It's a whole lot of normal people. Penn understands everything, okay? <laughs> My job here is right. to keep you guys grounded, okay? Right. And so I'm going to ask right. the real we'll people questions, she, okay? If she says you lost like me, it. Keith, we got to back up. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So can I ask the question, what is the James Webb Space Telescope? Okay, we'll just start. We'll just start with the basics. Yeah. Uh, you know, for years NASA and astronomers have been putting space missions into space to look at the stars and the sun and you know all kinds of cool stuff out there. The most famous of which is the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, again, we put telescopes into space because they're much more efficient. They don't have to look through the atmosphere of the Earth. You know, you got the Earth spinning every every 24 hours and clouds and all kinds of stuff. So, uh, you know, way back when and, you know, early 70s, telescopes have been going up in the space to, like I said, to look at everything from the, you know, the sun to planets to, to galaxies. So so it's just the James Webb is just a normal progression of technology and our ability and, and, and power of the telescope. However, the other thing is, is NASA took a big leap with the James Webb telescope. So it's not really an evolutionary, you know, just sort of a little bit better Hubble. It, it really is a huge leap ahead in technology and capability. And, and what astronomers are facing is that to look further across the universe, just a little bit further gets exponentially harder. So the telescopes have to be exponentially bigger and revolutionary. So hopefully that's in a, a good nutshell uh, why we put telescopes in space. When we first heard we were going to be able to talk to you, um, I told my team that I was going to talk to the commissioning manager of the telescope and their response was, that is so cool. Do you think he'd let you go see it? <laughs> so people, very, very smart people don't realize it's actually in space. In, in space. So please tell us where it is and why it's there. Yeah. So typically you think of, uh, uh, satellites that go into space, like communication satellites, uh, or weather satellites, they're just going around the Earth. They're a couple hundred miles up. Some of them are 20,000 miles up. The moon is about 250,000 miles away. Uh, we sent Webb about a million miles away. So it's four times the distance of the moon. It's actually in orbit around the sun, just like the Earth is. Uh, however, it's in a crazy place called the Lagrange Point 2, which is a whole bunch of mathematics there I won't get into. But anyway, so at Lagrange Point 2, uh, the telescope goes around the sun at the same pace as the Earth. 
So it always stays that million miles away from us, which is a really nice spot to put a telescope because it's always dark and, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a great place and it's not too far away that you can't communicate with it. So it's got to be d- very dark and very cold for this thing to work, correct? Yeah. So that's a big, that's a, probably the two biggest things that make Webb what it is, is that it's extremely large. Uh, we're about five times larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. And the other thing that scientists really need this, this telescope to be is cold. And that's because the if you really want to see the things that Hubble can't see, we have to see in the infrared wavelengths, uh, which is the part of the visible, you know, part of the electromagnetic spectrum that heat travels in. And so so really we need it. If I always say, like, if you went to the movie theater and they'd never turn down the lights, you would be really, really frustrated because your eyes would be overwhelmed. So we cool this telescope down so that it doesn't blind itself with its own heat. So our, our op- so we're looking for photons from the earliest, you know, things in the universe that ever were created have been traveling for billions of years. We're not, we're, there's not that many photons available. So the last thing we want to do is be overwhelming our cameras with, with this infrared heat from itself. So that's why we cool it down to these incredibly, incredibly cold temperatures, which was really part of the, the, the complexity of the mission. How are you doing so far, babe? I'm, I'm doing well. Like at the, 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 <laughs> end, the end there, I was like, the, the photons got the you. Photons the photons got, got, me. got you. Um, I, can yeah. I, so when the first images were released, Penn, sexy, sexy Penn as stopped, hell. you know, we yeah. had, you know, we had a meeting, we, you know, we work from home. So we have a group of people around our kitchen table. Great. They're talking oh, no. about, oh, you know, no. oh, silly yeah. videos we're going to do. And he stopped what we were talking about. And he was like, you guys, and he started explaining and he explained it in a great way. But can you tell me like, why is this such a big deal? And why somebody like me, who's, you know, concerned with carpool and getting my kids to do their summer reading and things like this should be caring about these images and the work that's coming out of this. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's sort of the hard science reasons that I won't bore you with. Right. Uh, You know, we, you know, all great science for science reasons over the past several hundred years have given us what we have today. And they, and those, and the folks who did science 300, 500 years ago, they had no idea what it was going to lead to. So, so just the hard science part of it is as, you know, as a, as a civilization and, and, and a, as a, you know, as a, as a country nation, we really need to de- need to do science. So that, that's the, <laughs> science that's is the good. Science part, good. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Science is good. Let's science just agree good. that science is good. Yes. The other thing that you should really, you know, other, other thing that people should really care about from a more practical standpoint regarding the science is that we really don't know anything. We don't know much about <laughs> the universe. We don't know much. We can't even solve our energy problems here on the planet. <laughs> right. There's all kinds of things we just don't know. However, the universe is actually doing stuff that we can't do. It's making stars. It made us. It made all the materials, everything on the periodic table. The universe did that on its own. So if we can, and it's and it's doing it now on its own. So if we can observe that and learn how it's doing it, someday we'll be able to bring that knowledge down. So everything from, from how light works to how gravity works to how uh, being able to manipulate matter and maybe even time, who knows? I'm getting a little wacky there, but the universe has it all figured out and it's, and it's showing us. We just have to observe it with these with these telescopes. And then I, I mentioned two things. But the third thing would be, you know, it it's it's it really demonstrates uh, the collective technological might of not only the United States but our partners in Europe and Canada. Mm-hmm. And what we can do, crazy stuff we can do when we all get together and, and really have a singular focus. Yeah, this this wasn't planting old glory on the moon and saying, we did it first. This was a global effort. And that's another reason why Absolutely. I really like I prefer this story over the moon landing and I'm gonna catch a lot of crap for that. But I, I think we're gonna learn a lot more from the 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 hardware that's up there. I would love yeah to just like take a second and talk about wasp 96 B um, and Mm -hmm. the exoplanet that you guys. So to me back up. All right. Okay. So wasp wasp wasp. And and you know what I'll do at the end of this is just like, let you guys talk. (laughs) It just unfiltered. But in the beginning, I'm just going to, we're going to, we're going to keep you, we're going to keep you engaged. Right. No. And by by the way, I super care about this. And what I loved what you said is like, we don't know anything. And that's what I love most about science is science is just waiting for better science. And I love yeah. scientists because they'll admit like, oh, we didn't know that. And I that's what I love right. about science. This is okay. going to be sexy as hell for you though, Kim, if you're ready. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to use ready. that term. Okay. So sexy. 
Science is sexy. We're we're going to find life with this telescope. I believe that we are going to find life either through a techno signature by finding like a pollutant in the atmosphere or something. Mm -hmm. And I found that and I learned that just by looking at this graph that you guys put out. It wasn't even a picture of an exoplanet, right. which is yeah, it's a planet that's uh, it's a gas giant about half the size of Jupiter. It's 1100 light years away from Earth. And somehow from that far away, your telescope was able to tell me that there's water vapor in the atmosphere. Water usually That's equals correct. life. That blew my mind more than any of the images. I'm wondering how you felt about that and, and how you're able to do that. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 uh, you know, when we started web 20 some years ago, we sci you know, astronomers didn't even know planets really existed around other stars. They, 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 they postulated it. And George Lucas was absolutely correct in star Wars. So he was way ahead of his time, but scientists really didn't know for sure there was planets around other stars. So we started web and it was not a capability that we, we intended it to do. So over the last 20 years, there's been lots of planets. There's been other missions that have discovered these stars, you know, these other planets. And then, so, We'll know we can never visit them. We, I mean, we just can't, not in our lifetime and not in generations to come. However, we do have the capability with something like Webb. And what we choose, we chose this planet uh, last week as a demo. It's just a demonstration that says we can sample these atmospheres of other planets, which is just crazy to think about. You, you mentioned a thousand light years away. And, and based on what's called spectroscopy, you know, where you break the light into all of its different. Well, I'm losing Kim right now. No, no, no. Anyway, I'm here. I've got it. You got it. We can break all of this light down into different wavelengths, and we know oxygen and water absorb different wavelengths of light, and our, and our astronomers can study that boring-looking graph. That boring-looking graph tells them more than any pretty picture because uh, it's hard numbers. It's hard data. Uh, and we can, and, and WASP, the one we just did last week or the one we showed last week, that's just the beginning. We knew that planet is not a life capable planet based on its super size. It's, it's probably a gas giant like Jupiter or something like that. However, over the next couple of years of the mission, Webb will be going after these candidate planets uh, that are sort of Earth. We, we know they're kind of Earth like as far as their temperature and, and their size and their rocky nature. And then we'll be able to sniff those atmospheres and look for all the different telltales that that could be what we would con what we believe to be elements of that would be conducive to supporting life. We're not sure we're going to discover life. However, we do know that water, methane, carbon dioxide, those are all the things here on Earth that we associate with, you know, our, our life forms. And you can look for pollutants as well. Isn't that right? That was something I read about in an article, which is really cool, which would mean intelligent life, like people who have built machinery yeah, we and can see We can see things like methane, yeah. uh, different different types of, uh, yeah, exactly right, pollutants in the atmosphere. So that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Uh, but this telescope is so good. Uh, we can point it so accurately and uh, we and the, and the techniques that exist now, we can do these type of, you know, these planets that we can never visit. Uh, but we can actually visit them virtually and study their atmospheres. That that kind of blows my mind, even though I know exactly how we do that. It's still kind of it's still kind of, you know, it just blows me away. I know that when we were sitting at the table and Penn was explaining, you know, the picture we were seeing and why it was so impactful. Anne Marie, who works with us, was it actually made her panic a little bit because she was yeah. like it made her feel I mean, I, like so, so insignificant that right. like what does it all mean to me it's like a great right. sense of calm to know like you know yeah. what i am stressed about carpool i'm stressed about my kids haven't started their <laughs> summer reading i'm stressed about the stuff and like right. we're like this little tiny speck i need to just chill but for her it was like a very overwhelming feeling yeah. um and you, yeah and i, I yeah Good. Yeah, I, I don't. There's a there's another big uh you know there's a vlogger out there called hank green oh i love him and i think he did yeah, Hank, he loves us. He's done. He's been a big web fan for years and years. And he just did a vlog a couple of days ago where he said, this can make you feel small. But to him, it made him feel large uh, because he, he had he has hope now and things we can do. And the fact that we think the universe is 13.8 billion years. The Earth has been around for four billion. That's about 20 to 30 percent of the universe's age. The Earth has been around. Now, life's not been around that long. However, the universe is young. The universe is going to go on for hundreds of billions of more years. So the fact that we've come about in basically the early part of the universe's life, he said that I thought he was a pretty clever guy. He said, that makes me feel large. That makes us feel important, especially when we can do these crazy things that we that, you know, just 400, you know, 400 years ago, Galileo 
was was we we were thinking the earth you know the sun went around the earth so it's crazy stuff that we're learning okay uh so we know that the telescope can take incredible deep field views of galaxies we uh Mm -hmm. you know hank did this i try to do this with kim we know that there you can look so far that you can actually see like a gravitational lens that bends time because if you find like a super dense galaxy it can bend time so that you look over the horizon of time and see back years and years in the future because of relativity that that part broke kim's brain a little bit um i got it but like i felt like yeah. breaks my brain too <laughs> okay. well thank you thank you yeah because yeah. there's i'm like i got i would get it and then i would like lose it i'm like okay do it again do it again like and he was so happy yeah. explaining it to it but yeah. yeah uh what what i would like people to know is what it was like for you to to soup to nuts get this thing up into space um we'll show mm-hmm. the pictures um on the visual side of this of you when your kids were young and you when your kids were fully grown and you you call this a fourth child. You did in, in an email that we had together. Um, I, I'd love you to take me a little bit through the journey and also just through some of your feelings of relief when it actually worked because it was nine billion dollars. And I would love yeah. you to I would love you to tell me about these single failure tests because you guys, you know, how like I try to explain this to my brother to my son. You know, how like I got to get him to a basketball game. Okay, he forgets his shoes. I can turn around and go get his shoes. The car right, breaks right, right. down. We could probably get an Uber like we left early enough. He forgets his water bottle. He'll drink out of the fountain. None of those are single failure issues. We'd have to like get in a wreck and go to the hospital to miss the basketball game. Right. That's how rare yeah, single yeah. Fail- failure issues are. Your telescope had yeah. 344 single failure issues that had to be tested when it was already gone. And if any of those things yeah. didn't work, you can't fix them. So that to me is one of the right. most high stress work environments i can ever possibly imagine i just asked you three oh, yeah. questions in a row I know, and i'm sorry he's really excited so I pick didn't, a question okay let's start with the, let's start with the let's start with the uh the 344 tests i want to know about like the stress levels when you know you've got to pass 344 tests that if any of them fail the entire thing doesn't work yeah so so one of our biggest challenges with web was as time went on you know it's a very long program uh you know, it, it, it sort of feeds on itself where the I, I hate to say the price tag goes up. So people say, well, it's really got to work now. We started Web with the understanding it was going to be incredibly risky. You, you compared us to Apollo and that's that's not far off. This is the most complex spacecraft that that people have ever built before. So it's not a bad analogy other than we didn't have human humans on it, which risked our lives. So as time went on, it, we, we, we got into this thing where we said we it has to work, even though it's risky. It has to work. So, and part of the problem that really in the last five, six years was testing it on the ground. Web was designed to be in space. Uh, the ground, it really doesn't like to be in gravity. Uh, gravity, it's very flimsy. It's very lightweight. So, so it was really about testing it on the ground and making sure that when we launched it, um, you know, as much as we could worked. And then we got into the fact that, you know what, there's just certain things we're never going to be able to test. Uh, we're going to have to use computer models, computer simulations, and eventually we're going to need a little bit of luck uh, to that. And and then and then so it was probably so we lived with that shadow. I guess that's sort of a cloud sure. that walks around with you uh, all the time is uh, this this cloud of failure. And I think as engineers on the program, and again, I'm I'm one of thousands. So there was you know there's so many people that that did so much for this mission. Um, we we kind of had that shadow over our head that failure is an option because we started out with an incredibly crazy complex idea. But as we got closer and closer, and the money started racking up, said you can't fail. You got to make this work. So that was a huge stress to us. Uh, and then eventually we get closer and closer to launch, where we go. You know what? We've done everything we can. We think it's as good as it can be. And then right about about two to three months before we launched, NASA, our public affairs folks, put out a video called 29 Days on the Edge. If you haven't seen that, uh, it basically talks about all this crazy stuff that has to go right. And what NASA was trying to do there uh, was trying to condition the public that, hey, this may not work. <laughs> uh, we're, we're confident we've done everything that it would work, but I wouldn't bet my pinky fingers or, or anything like that on it. And it was right around Thanksgiving, uh, you know, you know, so long and my family growing, and a lot of our families grew up with this, you know, you know, it was right around Thanksgiving. We're sitting around the table and my, and my daughter who was, you know, 21, she was dad, are you getting nervous? Yeah. And I'm like, 
do you think it's going to work? And I'm like, well, if it doesn't, we did everything we can. And then she says, and I, I'm, I'm quoting, but it's not the exact words. I'm sort of memorizing in my remembering it in my mind here. She said something like, I grew up with this thing. It better work. And Aww. at that point, the pressure was on. And uh, because they, they did it, my, my family loves this mission. They loved it. They, they've been along for the ride the whole time. And that's not just me. It's all of our families. And then we realized in the, we realized in December, the whole world was watching. Uh, the world was starting to get into us. And I think for me at that point, I stopped being an engineer who had this sort of black and white knowledge of how much, you know, the probability of it working or not. And I became sort of just a fan. And I'm like, I really want this to work, not just for me, but our astronomers, our scientists, and just our, you know, our, the world community that's really, really rooting for us. And then eventually we ended up launching on Christmas Day. And I'm like, wow, isn't that just suitable? Uh, here we are. We're going to ruin Christmas Day for a whole world. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but it all worked out. So that's a little bit of the pressure. It really didn't hit me until that last month uh, as we got closer and closer because failure was we just had so many things that we've never put this many eggs in one basket before. And, and unlike Hubble, uh, where astronauts could get to it and fix it, uh, we knew we weren't going to have a lifeline. We knew we were never going to have a, a phone a friend or anything like that to come out and help us out. So that all went into our mindset. And ultimately, it's that reality that caused us to delay a few years. We, we could have launched a few years ago, but we wanted to do more testing. We wanted to make sure it was perfectly right. We, we got a lot of criticism for it, you know, delaying and it takes more money. Uh, but we knew we had to get it right and ultimately had to deal with COVID hitting us in 2020, just like it did the rest of the world. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit of the angst uh, of all those failures. And then as we got on to, on to orbit, starting right after Christmas and through New Year's and into January, and, and I think you guys may have been doing a race or something like that. <laughs> something but anyway, like that. <laughs> we were actually doing a, <laughs> we were doing a commissioning this telescope and it was just every day we had to, we had to be successful every day. We had something new. So I always tell people it's sort of like playing a video game and every level was boss level. Oh. And your only reward for winning that level was to go to the next level and yeah. do it all over again. So for, so watch that video. If you haven't, it's called 29 days on the edge and it's very, very accurate. That's what we went through. Um, you know, when Matt, when NASA launched, uh, landed perseverance on Mars last year, they had a video called seven minutes of terror. Um, you know, where everything has to go right or you don't land on Mars. So, so that's why I said 29 days on the edge, because we had 29 days of activities that if anywhere along that chain of events, we had a failure, it was it was end of, you know, pretty much could have been end of the road for us. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of idea of the, the angst we were going through. And I tell people, I was like, it's not necessarily a, a, a joy. It was more of a relief. Mm -hmm. um, but then as we got the imaging and we started seeing how powerful this telescope was, we, it turned into joy real fast. And so speaking of joy, when when you were able to see those first images and your family was able to see them, what what was what was that emotion? Yeah, it was it was a little bit less for us because we had a little bit of a sneak peek. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the family hadn't seen anything, of course. But so back in March, when we first focused the telescope, uh, we did some press releases and, uh, you know, we, 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 were, we were using a star that's really close by to focus the telescope. Uh, our optical team was doing an incredible job. You know, they're, they're literally focusing a telescope a million miles away. And, and, and I think it was March 12th or something, they had finished their job. Uh, they had fully aligned the telescope and they released an image of this star to show just how good Webb was doing as far as how crisp and, you know, how crisp the image was. And then in the background of this image was hundreds and hundreds of galaxies. And we weren't trying to capture galaxies. Wow. These are really, really short exposures. And I think it's at that point where we all went, oh, my, this is we've we've far outdone what we thought this thing could do, because this telescope isn't even trying. It's, it's exposures, uh, just like photography. So. You know, we were only exposing for a couple hours on the star to get to get the alignment image. And then, you know, so we see all these galaxies in the background. So that for me was probably the emotional moment where I was like, this thing is going to be incredible. Um, and then and then, you know, you know, so, so it was a little bit of a, a slower uh, experience for me personally. But but just the reaction of the world, my family, friends. Uh, they just been overwhelmed. And, you know, the one of the, you know, the one of the nebula, the one we released last, I mean, that's just absolutely stunning, gorgeous. 
Um, and I and I think that's the payoff right there for everybody else. Of course, the scientists, they want the numbers. They want the data. Um, but for the rest of us, we want to see the beauty of our universe. And, and we couldn't and they couldn't have they couldn't have picked a better target than, than what they did. So I want to get this clear. The, those pictures that you guys showed us and that President Biden was referring to, you were trying to, to capture stars and images like that. And then those little dots that look like Halloween candy littered on someone's floor, those were unexpected. Mm -hmm. Those, because those, those were the stars. I mean, those, I mean, I, I'm, but what I mean, like those got top billing, you almost forget yeah. about the fact that there's a star there and you're like, good God. There's giant right. galaxies, and that was you're telling me that you that was an accident. There was no way of you knowing that that was going to be theoretically possible. Yeah, it, yeah. Now the the Biden image or the one that the the the, the one what we call our deep field. Yeah. You know that was intentional. That was to go after those galaxies okay, I gotcha. that are furthest away from the Earth. It was really our test images where we're trying to look at a star nearby, and it's basically getting photo bombed by thousands of galaxies <laughs> in the background, which is you know just blew us away. And we knew we had a great telescope. We knew it was cold. Getting this thing cold was not not easy, and, and all that just created an incredible observatory. So, so the the one that um, the the one we showed the deep field that the president debuted on, I think it was Monday night a week ago, maybe um, that was a deep field. All these images were picked to demonstrate different capabilities of the telescope. Uh, so that one was demonstrated to say, hey, we're we built this machine to go after the very first stars. Uh, and, and, and galaxies that ever came into being after, you know, Big Bang. We know we can do it because this was just a four hour exposure. We have the capability of holding our aperture, our theoretical lens open for, for 14 dates. Mm. So you're going to see some incredible stuff. This, the images we released last week, the telescope wasn't even trying. This was just like taking your what? iPhone out and just yeah. snapping around. Just um, the casual real hard candids. stuff. The stuff you yeah, haven't gone to portrait view yet. yet. Yeah, you haven't. Yeah, you're just yeah, taking candidates. Yeah. We're going to go into, uh, you know, stuff that's going to win the Nobel Prizes. That that stuff's coming up this fall. So, and, and the telescope's really going to be put through the paces and, and it's going to be really amazing. Uh, can you tell me well, more? That can was my next teaser? questions of like what. So if this is, if this is casual, like how, if all of a sudden this thing has become like Instagram model and like really putting effort in, like what can we expect to see? <laughs> You know those girls that stand on the beach uh, well, and they have like twelve people helping them take one picture. So if we're going into Instagram yeah. mode, what what can this telescope show us? I think I think there's two things. One is we built this telescope to go after the very first you know stars that formed after the Big Bang, um, and, and, and we've never seen anything. We've never seen it. We don't know how that happened. We know the universe came in existence. It was dark. And for some reason, all this hydrogen gas due to gravity and all kinds of crazy stuff decide to make stars. We don't, we don't have any imaging of that. We never, we have theoretical models. Um, so, so that's the real, that's what I would call the cosmological stuff. The other thing is, you know, it's, it, it, it's what we've already talked about with uh, these planets and, and being able to possibly pick up some, uh, you know, some of those ingredients. That's a big one. I think that's, that's probably the other Instagrammable, uh, <laughs> type of data that you're going to be seeing, uh, coming out, uh, coming out later. Uh, our first year is chock full of some of the hardest science that Webb will ever have to do. Um, so it's, it's going to be really, really good stuff. So, so stay, so stay tuned. Uh, today I saw a picture of Jupiter with Europa in front mm -hmm. of it. Uh, I know that, I know that Webb is not meant for the, the close up stuff. Like you, the Hubble image of Jupiter is clearer than the, the web image oh, that I saw yeah. today. Yeah. Um, which means yeah. they're, they're, they're used, they're used for different things, but you know, I'm, right. I'm, I would love to see Oh, God, I'm going to nerd out so hard. I'd love to see like the evidence of vapor coming out of the South Pole of Enceladus. I would love to I, like, so yeah. th I mean, there could be possible life signatures in our solar system. Is Webb capable of going after that? Or is that going to be someone else's job? Yes. No, that, that's Webb. Webb can do that. Obviously, we can visit those planets with uh, remote spacecraft that are visiting them. They get a little bit of a closer up view. Mm -hmm. the, the image that came out from Jupiter the other day was a was a test image. Okay. Um, and, and and you know, obviously, our public affairs folks they have a hard job of conveying that those type of information. So sure. it wasn't the maybe the sexiest Instagram photo of Jupiter we've ever seen, but uh. Uh, it was a test image, and we wanted people to know that we can take imaging from Mars out. Uh, we can see Mars and then every other planet. 
Um, but so you'll you'll and and being able to look at some of those uh, the moons of Jupiter and even Saturn uh, to to look for some of the stuff you're talking about there is definitely on the plate. Uh, you know, year a few years ago we we uh, spacecraft visited Pluto. Um, Pluto is going to be a big target for Webb. Again, remember Webb is seeing in the infrared, so it's seeing heat uh, wavelengths of light that are that are heat. So it's it's and it and it has some of these spectroscopic spectroscopic abilities to be able to, to, to really interrogate the atmospheres of our own planets in our own solar system. So, so yeah, the Jupiter planet was a little bit funny to me. I, I saw it, I went, ooh, people aren't gonna be too thrilled by that one, even though the, the scientists and the engineers are geeking out over it. <laughs> I think it's really hard. Yeah. One of the hardest parts of what you have to do right now is selling in, it is well just in a in a world in which everybody's watching 15 second TikToks, right? Yep. To, and you have like a fuzzy image of a, something they've seen clear in the past, like making it make sense in in these bite sized yeah. things. So that's <laughs> as if launching this wasn't it's terrifying a, and hard enough. Having to, you know making it digestible for the rest of us. So I applaud you it's a, it's in that tough, effort. Yeah, they do. They they have a tough job. They really do. Our our, our communication folks do a a wonderful job, but they do have a hard job. And you're right. The attention span of the public is very, very fickle. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, you know, they, the, the, you'll, you'll see these big splashes. They're probably not going to keep dripping out images week after week after week because people will, will tune that out. So you'll probably see another big splash with some other, you know, some really good science, uh, you know, later this fall. Um, I think that's their approach, which which makes sense because we, we all have our short attention span. A pen holderness here would sit for every image, any image that yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to share. So I, I would. I also, <laughs> but honestly, I almost think we need to keep Keith on speed dial because I don't think I've done a very good job explaining it to a commoner. I've been trying to over nerdify it today and Keith has done a better job of bringing me down to earth, which is not what was supposed to happen. We were supposed to like... <laughs> Help translate him. I'm the one who's like, eh, and settle this. I feel like an idiot. Like I'm trying to impress him on this entire interview. You're, and he's, yeah, you're, you're, no, you're doing great, yeah, we, honey. Like, I, I don't know. We, 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 we tell everybody because, you know, people just say, look, this, this is everybody's mission. You know, everybody deserves to know about this stuff. And just so you know, just so you know, uh, Jimmy Buffett is visiting our mission op center this afternoon. And uh, I'm skipping that because I wanted to talk to you. Oh, come oh, on. What? No way. I mean, I would skip no, this no, no. to I go see Jimmy me. Buffett. Okay, is there a chance if we let you go now, you can go say hi to him? No, I'm good. I really am good. That, that you would oh not gosh. believe uh, how uh, good I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I just, I am just... <laughs> Listen, there are, there is so much happening on this planet that it's very overwhelming to to me. And so, anytime Penn like the the um, he reads this stuff for fun and just like, he'll read like an aerospace textbook for fun. But then the kind of the genre of light reading he like is called hard science fiction, yeah, which is really funny. It's a weird sounding. So, but so he, as soon as I start complaining about somebody, well, I, my thing is when private citizens are spending billions of dollars just to kind of circle the planet, I'm like, do you know how many hungry people that could feed? He is quick yeah, to say, yeah. I defend he, them. He's, he, he's quick to defend just because of what you yeah. said. Like, we don't know anything. Well, and so, Well, yeah. well again, I, I don't want to go back to Hank Green again, but right. I, I don't know. He put out this video on web maybe 11 years ago where – he had this sort of mantra of, you know, you have to decrease the suck while you're also increasing the awesomeness. And web is about increasing awesome. I mean, we're not we're not solving COVID. We're not dealing with with uh, with famine or hunger. We're we're increasing awesome. Uh, and but at the same time, you have to balance that with decreasing suck. And he does this great video about, you know, how you have to balance that because if you're a if you're a if you're a civilization and all you focus on is uh, is uh, decreasing the suck, you won't have the capabilities to decrease the suck eventually. So you have to balance these two. You know, the reason we have vaccines for things like COVID and things like that is because scientists did science and they they got they had to spend a lot of money to do that. So and, and so anyway, the Hank Green, he, he that's why I keep bringing him up because he sure. really captured it best with, you know, we all we are all sympathetic. And we all need to solve some serious, serious problems on the earth, but it's only via technology that we'll ever even have a chance to do it. Um, so anyway, so yeah, Hank's a big fan and we're a big fan. No, <laughs> I, 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 I'm a huge fan. I send yeah. him Hank Green videos. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like, is this what you were trying to say? So no, we are all well, Hank Green fans, yeah, yeah. believe me. 
and, and yeah, he he did the cl- he did the closest job of anybody. I would say even better than Neil deGrasse Tyson of, of explaining that gravity circle, that gravity lens yes. um, that that you guys sent yeah. out. Oh yeah, Neil, Neil deGrasse he does a great job at our images of explaining some of that stuff, which is really good. Oh, and but not to, I keep bringing up Hank Green, but you know my daughter who grew up, she's a big Hank Green. She follows his Twitter account, and I think we were deploying the Sun Shield one day, and Hank Green, you know, tweeted. Hey, Webb just finished deploying at Sunshield, and I was narrating, so my my yep. photo was on his Twitter account. Well, my daughter retweets it, and she says, "You know, proud daughter moment." My dad showed up on Hank Green's Twitter <laughs> account, so I'm like, so I'm like, you know, it, I, I just I was more. I like the fact that she retweeted me. <laughs> that yeah. was what made me so happy. She was so proud. <laughs> that was a great. That was actually like a a fair. Like I skimmed the two and a half hour video on YouTube because it got served up to me where you were explaining with a, a very yeah, informed yeah. woman about what was going on and they were they were unfold they were yeah. unfolding the sun shield. Yeah. Which isn't yeah. is the sun shield is that the thing over your shoulder? Isn't it like a uh what no, is that's like a Maryland flag no. no like the honeycomb thing. Oh, what yeah is, that what that. That, that's it. Right. So t- can you tell us about that? Like what th- that that's the sun shield, right? This is the yeah this is the sun shield. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And and remember I said we were about a million miles away. Uh, and we put this big shield out to just block the sun. The sun is always on one side. And it, and if you'll notice, it's you can do this right. There's five of these layers. So uh-huh. it's actually five shields. And it's these five layers that lets this telescope be down near absolute zero. While this side is broiling hot, you could boil water on this side. So that's why we big and this, this sun shield, NASA has never deployed anything this big in orbit before. And, and it was one of the most complex pieces of hardware that NASA's ever built. So that's why it was kind of a big deal. If this doesn't deploy correctly, we don't get a cold telescope when we don't have those great images just all the other day. So the Sun Shield was really one of those. Of the two, I think you mentioned the 340 some single point failures. We had a good majority of those were related to the Sun Shield. So, <laughs> so that's were, why we were you were sweating. doing uh, you were doing PR for them as this was deploying. Did you? That's right. Yeah, we did a play by play. So that was a good that was a funny story. So we're in the middle of COVID and we, you know, our pubs people, they wanted to do a studio, you know, where we had some people who knew things. Uh, But eventually we ended up doing everything remotely. So uh, we had to do this play by play. So I had the privilege of being selected to help our, you know, help do the play by play. And at the same time, the team of engineers that really knew what they were doing, uh, they were they were actually doing all the hard work that day. And I got the you know, I got the the fun job of, of describing what they were doing. And, uh, you know, the many, many of those women and men were, you know, they had been working on this sun shield. It was their life for for 15, you know, 15 plus years. So that was a huge moment for them uh, to be able to get that thing out and a, a big sigh, you know, big relief for all of us. So that was a big day. As somebody who suffers with anxiety, I'm talking about myself. I don't know <laughs> how I would have been able to stomach the 29 days you were talking about or this, the yeah. deploying the sun shield because right. like, cause at that point, like your work is kind of done, right? Like it's right. up there. And what are you going to, yeah. what are you going to do? Oh my gosh, this is yeah, like, yeah. people part, with anxiety and, and can't do this my, stuff. <laughs> yeah, part of my job as the commissioning manager was to spend a lot of time worrying about everything that could go wrong. Mm. Uh, and then to make sure we had at least some plan to, um, to to maybe get us out of the woods with it. So a lot of things that'll go wrong, you can't recover from. Some things that go wrong, you can recover from. So we had hundreds and hundreds of what I call contingency plans or backup plans. And, and amazingly enough, we didn't have to pull out very many of them. So that was quite amazing. I think actually people with anxiety would have been brilliant at this because that's yeah. all I do is <laughs> think about yeah. what things could go wrong. Well, so where it does my, yeah. yeah, I tell people my main job for, from like the three years for leading the launch was to figure out how to kill web. So it was, it can wear on you. <laughs> it really can wear on you where you're like, wow, this could really happen. Is there anything we could do about it? Mm, probably not. So let's just cross our fingers and hope that doesn't happen. So. Aren't there so many parallels between this telescope and Keith and raising a child? Like he called it his fourth <laughs> child, but I'm just thinking like, it's almost like the, the launch is it's like, it's either getting its driver's license or it's going to college. Yeah. Like we're dealing with our daughter yeah. has her learner's permit right now. And I feel a yeah. lot like a person trying to launch the web telescope into space. And like, once she gets that license, 
It's like you hope you've done everything right. Right. But you just yeah. don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you, 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 and yes. And that never stops, by the way. I, I think our kids are a little <laughs> older than yours, but it never it never stops. Really? They're, you know, I have. Yeah, it doesn't stop. You're like, you know, did they get the work today? Okay, uh, they're 25. They should be able to. Well, <laughs> so, and, I, you know, it's, so, and the other thing is something like you're exactly right because it, it's a great parallel because I always we always joke around the house. I'm like, why didn't these things come with instruction manuals? They didn't come with anything. And um, you know, and and building a one-off mission like Web, there was no textbooks to read. We had no instruction manuals on how to do something crazy like this. So it's a good, it's a good parallel because uh, yes, it was like sending your kid out the door and there's nothing you can do at some point. You just have to, just have to suck it up and uh, hope it all works. Hope you did. <laughs> I, it, it, that really is the best parallel because you hope yeah, you've yeah, done yeah. everything right. And then also yep. it's a little crazy to learn that it, I'm still going to be worrying so much because it's so funny when my, this has nothing to do with space, but when I had, oh, no, all- when my, when my daughter was a baby and I told my mom, I'm like, you know what, if I could just get her to sleep through the night, then I can stop worrying. <laughs> and my mother laughed. She's like, oh no. She's like, I still worry about you. And you just, I'm like, oh my gosh, are you serious? Like I'm going to worry this much every single day. She's like for the rest of yeah. your life. And, and to bring my it My best back, friend, yeah. I said, he's my best friend. We all had children about the same time. And he says, you know what? My kids are getting older. And he's like, you know what? He's like, the thing with parenting is the constantness of it. It's just, it's, and it never stops. And you can talk to your parents, your grandparents are like, no, you're always our, you're always going to be our babies, and we're always going to, you know, hmm. have that anxiety about you. So, Good and I have know. anxiety about web now, right? Because it's out there a million miles away on its own, Aww. getting hit with micrometeorites. It's oh, it did. It got and, one of them got hit, yeah, right? Didn't, and, it, didn't you guys get hit by a micrometeor? We did. Um, now we designed for this. We knew we were going to get hit by micrometeoroids. We're going to hit. We're going to get hit by thousands, tens of thousands over its lifetime. And, and just to put micrometeoroids in context, they're probably somewhere about the size of a grain in baby powder, not sand, baby powder Ooh. particles uh, that hit us at very, very high speeds. There's a lot of energy related to this. The thing that happened to us this year that was surprising is one of them was a little bit bigger than we had expected so soon in the mission. Over 20 years, we do expect to get these big ones from time to time. So the fact that we got kind of a big one early on, we're like, our models correct? You know, did, did we, did we miss something? But web is fine. Uh, but again, it's like your baby, it's out there in the, mm. the harshness of space on its own. And, uh, you know, it's, it's fighting and, you know, it's got to deal with this stuff on its own. We can't really help it too much. <laughs> mm. Now is, what is the life of the, what's the ex- life expectancy? Sorry. No, I'm just, I, he's got, <laughs> it's an exciting we got answer. 20 years of fuel. We, we got, we got our limiting life thing is fuel. We'll run out of fuel in 20 years. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and our minimum requirement for fuel was five years. Uh, but, but the fact that, uh, we got a really good launch on Christmas day, uh, the Ariane five put us right on the money. And then our spacecraft team, our propulsion team, our navigation team, they were on the clock, uh, basically about a 12 hour clock to get all the data up the web. So it knew how to fire its rockets and for how long. We did that as smooth. It's one of the things I talk about contingency planning. One of the things we were all worried about was doing that first maneuver where we fired our engines uh, to make sure Webb could have enough velocity. We worried about that. We had contingency plans that were, you know, thick. And our team executed flawlessly on Christmas night. And uh, and because of that, we, we think we have at least 20 plus years of fuel. So the scientists are absolutely tickled. Um, the, the fact that this is going to be, you know, this observatory is going to be around when we're hopefully we can hopefully we can see the end of it. <laughs> Us Gen Xers. Oh, right. Hey, guys, stick oh, together, yeah. Gen Xers. This, Gen X made this happen. This is no, this is Gen yeah, X's yeah. moon landing. I'm telling this you. This is Gen X's moon it's landing. Like they, they happened to launch on Christmas night when probably very few people were aware because it was Christmas and they were with their family. But is, like I. Is. I am here. I'm here with Hank Green to bring as much attention to this as possible because it is implausibly awesome. Like this, the, right. the, the suck is down. The awesome is up. I hope everyone you work with is in an awesome mood right now. They should be. Oh yeah, they, they should be. Yeah, I, I told Christmas Eve we were counting down. The clock clicked over on 12 a.m. Uh, on Christmas Day, and you know I took some time to talk to the team. 
you know, I didn't I didn't bring up the fact that Apollo 8, you know, when it circled the moon on Christmas Eve and, and, and uh, they, you know, they read that great passage from the Bible about creation. Yeah. And, the let there be light. And I was, you know, it was a little bit cliche is you don't want to you know, be too corny, but I was like, look guys, we're launching a machine that's going to try to capture that first light after the universe came into existence, you know, whether it was created or it created itself, it doesn't matter. It's, we're going to go after the very first light. So it was really kind of a special Christmas Eve for all of us to, to be able to really do what you, it, Apollo is, is definitely a great, you know, one of the awesome things humanity's ever done. Uh, but the, you're right. This is our unmanned. This is an unmanned version of Apollo, uh, as far as its complexity. Um, I just have a, a question. Maybe it, was there a reason why it was on Christmas? Was it a weather thing or just semi? We Christmas? were our original launch day. We launched out of South America uh, in French Guiana. If for people who want to learn their geography, that's just right up north of uh, Brazil on the on the uh, equator, close to the equator, and. Um, uh, we were supposed to launch on December 12th, and because of some delays and things like that, we got into the week of Christmas. Uh, we eventually moved it to uh, Christmas Eve, and then we had a lot of weather coming in down there. Okay. So, uh, just curious, it was, it was really just it was just weather. It was just really that was the only day that had good weather was Christmas Day. Okay, just wondering if there was like a <laughs> didn't want it in a news cycle type of thing. Just just curious. And, and I'm imagining yeah. if you guys were like, "Hey, it's Christmas. Can we take the day off?" Then you were going to have to wait like three more months or something crazy like that. No. Right? <laughs> yes, yeah, no, we had about two, we had about 200 people in French Guiana yeah. away from their families, and the last yeah. thing they wanted to do was wait another day. Respect, so. respect. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, is, yeah. what are we missing? What's the big thing that you want the people that are listening to this to understand, to know? What have we forgotten to ask you? Uh, yeah, I, you know, when it comes to space exploration, we are probably getting into the golden age. Um, everything from commercialization, you see that with our, our, our flights front up, you know, by SpaceX. Um we landed on Mars last year. We got mission. We got. We had NASA had so much success last year. Um, we're getting to the point. I don't want to say space is getting easy, uh, but people really need to be excited about you know just some of the you know just the the inspiration uh, that you know not just NASA but private industry. We're we're basically moving into a completely different era of space exploration, and and maybe maybe in our lifetime you'll see some commercial flights to the moon. Uh, maybe commercial flights to, 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 you know, but it takes both. It takes industry. It takes private industry. It takes, it takes government agencies like NASA. It takes all of, it takes a world, it's a world coming together. At least, at least the, uh, the part of the world that shares our values, like our European partners in Canada, uh, you know, it takes all of us coming together. And, and, you, and last year was just a stellar year for space exploration, whether it was, you know, manned flights or, or just going to other planets. And then I think we, we sort of, uh, the icing on the cake was the web launch in December. You saw me shake my head when you're talking about like private trips to the moon, because I mean, that's his dream. And I just, no, I just, just stay here with me. I, to me, space is the most interesting part of my, um, existence outside of my family. Like I, (laughs) outside of my family and friends, I I just, to me, like, it's what I read about. It's what I watch movies about. It's what I do in my spare time. He loves a movie where they've assembled the best in their field to to like solve a space problem. Yeah. Like, well, Apollo 13 was awesome. The, the for all mankind, which is like this butterfly effect show for those of you who haven't watched Mm -hmm. it. It's like imagining what would have happened if we'd lost the original space race. Uh, And and the, the, the the spoiler is that we work harder and we're still doing it. You know, yeah, instead yeah, of, yeah. um, so yeah. no, I, I love all that stuff. And so to the, talk- the only other thing, Cam, I, the only other thing, if I could say this is, uh, uh, web, web, you know, they say battle, they say wars are won by the lieutenants on the field. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what web was. There was not one single person that was responsible for its success. Our chief engineer for the, for the mission, Mike Menzel, probably one of the best engineers of the planet. He's probably the most responsible for the success of this mission, but it was thousands and thousands of people. And then, you know, some people in key positions that I, that I was had the privilege of working with for many, many years. If one of those folks weren't, was not on the job, uh, I'm not sure we'd be on orbit right now. So web was this weird, weird gathering of, of the best in your field, so many talents at the right, at the right time in the right place, yes. <laughs> at the right time in the right place. And, and, and there's just so many thousands of people that poured their, 
their heart and soul into this thing. And I think that's just another thing that uh, hopefully folks will appreciate that is uh, just so many people work so hard on this for so long. I love that. It, that's right. Why, that's why you're so excited, honey. They've assembled, they've the, best assembled the best in their field in real life. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for yeah, skipping yeah. No, meeting you. Jimmy Buffett. I feel like Penn should sing for you if you should have like, <laughs> I mean, we, we, we well, deserve I, I, some jazz hands or something. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm I, trying am, to I am waiting for the, I'm assuming you can do a tribute parody song to Webb eventually. I mean, I, I actually, with his- <laughs> we talked about it. We talked about it last week and um, yeah. I just, I, th- I think I needed to talk to someone like you first so I could understand. Because what I was terrified of was getting any facts at all wrong. Um, I, I, yeah, do, yeah. I do think that, I, you know, I've been consuming. I think CNN has a great space section. They put it up a lot. New York Times has a, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a, a really good space scientist. But I wanted to make sure I got all this right because you do not want to run afoul of of space fans <laughs> if you get something incorrect so that's like the main reason yeah. I haven't done and, it. That, and that's where that's where our public affairs folks are really really good at this they they, they do an excellent job of working with uh, all different types of media um you know i think that's one of the big things with nasa these days is is we're, we're finally getting um we do a really good job our twitter account for for web our our team they just had the best tweets uh, you know, they were just spot on with their, with their funny kind of, you know, tweets that they do. So they're really good. So if you want them to review something, they would love to work with you. I remember years ago, it was the most funny thing. It was back when we were early days of web, we had, uh, Jimmy Fallon and one of his producers came to the Goddard space flight center and made a rap video. Um, and it, it, it's the most, it's the funniest thing. I'll send you guys a link to it if you want, but, uh, um, yeah, you, you, who knows? You could probably make, yeah, I think you're on the East coast, but maybe you could swing by Goddard or, uh, or oh, even I can swing. And get oh, some I can swing by. Swing get by. <laughs> he will be there before the close of business. He yeah, can invite himself places. Oh my gosh. You know, he's thinking of, he's thinking of the space telescope, the musical right now, aren't you? A little bit. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's, let, let's, let's let him well, go. You'll like, you'll like this. I'll send you the link to the Milky J thing. It's really stupid and bad. Milky J. You would appreciate it. That okay. stupid Milky and bad J, is yeah. like, that's our jam. <laughs> Thank you. We really are yeah. just humbled that you spent so much time with us. Uh, and I pray that the people listening have, have a better understanding of this. And I appreciate why this is such a big deal i certainly do so thank you for all you've done and yeah thank you for your time thank you guys for telling our story that that we really appreciate that also (sighs) how do you feel pen well i honestly i blacked out a little bit there because i was like so starstruck and i started the whole point of this was for me to try to help explain this to people more simply and then i kept trying to have like flex and dunk on him. Like I was trying to give like way too specific information uh, and, and he ended up being the one. He was like, bring it down. Pen. We know that you're, bring it you down. know, fancy names of stars uh, that are, this yeah. must be what it was like when you met George Clooney and you couldn't control your behavior. Yes. Like, do, do you want to tell that story to people? I think I've told that story. Cause we have it on video, but I don't th- know that like the video is attainable, but I saw the video of her interviewing George Clooney when she was working at inside edition and she didn't, she like lost the ability to communicate correctly. Right. It's when it was like 15 <laughs> years ago when he was got an Oscar nomination for like directing, but then he was also starring in a movie that same year and I was like twirling like my hair and like, I was like, so like, do you like being like in front of the camera or like behind the camera? Like I couldn't <laughs> speak. And that's not how you normally talk. No. And, and, <laughs> and part of my job at Instant Edition, I did a lot of red carpet interviews. So I did interview celebrities most weeks at some point I right. was and and I've, I've interacted or, I mean, they wouldn't know me from Adam, by the way, but I've met when I told Lola that I've met Taylor Swift like four times, Taylor Swift, who was like a baby herself when I was interviewing her was delightful and kind. And I interviewed her like two weeks in a row. It was like the CMAs and then the, Whatever she like remembered my name. I think her publicist told her, by the way. But, but the fact that she said yeah, it, totally you know, chill relationship with these mega stars. No, no, no. But George yeah. Clooney was just so. So when you said that's why when you're like it's like George Clooney, like that's the level of 
right. starstruckness with our friend Keith. But for that reason, I don't know that I was the best interviewer. I think you did a better job. I'm like, I, I we like to end our podcast by criticizing ourselves. Yeah. Um, and I think that you did a better job actually um, asking him questions than I did. I think I was like too far up in the weeds, but I hope, I still hope that people learned a, well, a little bit. Well, I hope so too, because let's, let's face it that this has been a project that's been in the work for what, like 17, 18 years. And in one hour podcast, you're not going to learn everything. My right. only goal was to help myself. And this is the selfish reason we do podcasts, understand why this is so important because everybody was talking about it and every news organization was carrying it and every celebrity was posting about it. And I wanted to, but I was still stressed about what was happening on I here. Know. And so I wanted to know, and I loved what he said. He's like, we, we don't know anything. And to have the, have the ability to, to solve the problems on this planet, we need to look beyond this planet. And yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a believer. Well, I loved it. Thank you for taking the time to sit with, with me and Keith um, and uh, like learning more about my passion project, which is not even my project. It's just me understanding somebody else's uh, unbelievable undertaking. He said 20,000 people worked on this thing. And um, so that happened. That's my George Clooney. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. And uh, we appreciate you. Remember to subscribe to this podcast um, wherever you're listening or if you're watching on our YouTube channel, if we even put this on our YouTube channel. That's yeah, possible. I don't know. It's I don't possible. know how it's going to work. Yeah. Anyway, um, love you guys. Bye. Bye. Do we have an ad read? No. Okay. I'm going to send this right now. And then do you want to send notes to the them? No. What notes am I sending? Uh, well, start.